Good morning, everybody. It is time for a coffee break. Welcome to the Lock Doc Security Podcast. Chad Lingefeld here alongside of Kevin Starr, and we have a special guest with us this week, and uh, his name is Tony Hokinson from Bloomington, Minnesota. How are you doing, Tony? Pretty good. How are you guys doing? Well, we're doing fantastic. Uh, it is, it's a beautiful day here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We just weathered uh, the after effects of Hurricane Florence. Uh, I think by the time it got here, it was like a, a tropical depression or something. Tropical storm, yeah. It was just a lot of rain and, and some yes, wind. Yes, a lot of rain. But yeah, it's it's been really good. So we're excited to uh, to sit back down, and uh, we didn't have any major damage here. There were some folks on the the coastline and, and, and on the way in that uh, it suffered some damage and some flooding. And there were some areas in Charlotte that had some flooding as well. But um, but yes, for the most part, I think everybody is, is doing all okay. So how are things up there in Minnesota? Pretty good. A little rainy today, though. We had some big storms yesterday, and it looks like it's going to be raining all day today. Um, it's been really hot. I think it was in the 90s all weekend, but finally cooling down a little bit into the 60s for the rest of the month, I think. Oh, wow. What What is the typical weather up there for you guys? A lot of snow, or is that just... Uh, in the winter, yes. We usually start getting snow in December or so. Um, last year, it lasted all the way through April. I think we were... I was on the way home from the ISC conference, and we got almost a foot and a half of snow in April. I remember so. that. We were talking about that when we were uh, when we were out in Las Vegas, and you were saying that you guys weren't even sure if you were going to be able to land very easily. Yeah, it wasn't easy, I can tell you that. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, thank you very much for taking some time out of your schedule to join us um, for the podcast today. We're also obviously on Facebook Live right now, and uh, just really, I think this is going to be a fun conversation today. But before we jump into kind of the meat of the conversation, which is going to be dealing a lot with uh, kind of growing and building a team to scale a business is kind of the, the 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 topic of discussion for today. But before we dive into that, I want to get a little more background. Tony has been on several of the vlogs. Uh, he's been around for a while. He's visited us here in our office. Um, so I wanted to get dive a little bit more into who Tony is and a little bit more about his business uh, so that we have some context in what we're dealing with and uh, kind of by way of introduction. So, Tony, give us a little history on uh, on Bloomington Security and Minneapolis Lock and Key. Yep. Right? You guys, two, two different uh, companies now. So tell us a little bit about that, a little history on yourself and uh, how you have arrived to, to, to what you're working on today. Yeah. So uh, we've been around since 1964. Um, my dad actually bought into the company about 38 years ago, um, and we, we've slowly grown over the years. Um, we started out doing mainly locksmithing and really got into doing a lot of electrified door hardware for other integrators and kind of found a niche there. And, and after a while, we realized that we're doing a lot of the locking hardware. We can also do some of the electronics as well. So about 15 years ago or so, opened up a low voltage division and have been, have been slowly growing that as well. Uh, we do everything from cameras to card access, uh, lock work, electrified door hardware, key systems, very similar to you guys. And um, we also do a little bit of alarm systems as well. We just recently purchased a smaller alarm company as well. Uh, they're called ESS and uh, we're kind of expanding our alarm division there. Um, uh, about a year ago, we purchased Minneapolis Lock and Key uh, located right in the heart of Minneapolis. They do a lot of uh, unique locksmithing. Uh, there's a lot of old homes in the area and they, they're really good with the, the skilled trade of working on old mortise locks and kind of preserving the, the heritage of the houses in that area. So where we go out a lot of times and re, uh, fix or replace locks, they actually go out and um, repair them because if you have a really old house, you don't want to put a brand shiny new lock on it. You want to kind of maintain that structural integrity of it. So they have some really skilled uh, craftsmen down there that do a great job of preserving locks. Um, I started working here in high school. Um, I lived kind of far from the office, so I didn't come in all the time, but over the summers, I worked in our shop, uh, getting to know locksmithing. Um, and then in college, I started working out in the truck with some of our low voltage technicians, just learning that that part of the trade. Um, and then spent a little time working in the accounting department. And then actually after college, I got an internship at Thomson Reuters, a finance company here in the area and worked there for a couple of years, just kind of wanted to get some other experience um, in the corporate world, decided that that wasn't for me. And I wanted to come back and work for a small business someplace where I could um, more easily make a change and make an impact. Uh, I've been working here now full time for about five years. Uh, started out doing a lot of what Kevin's been doing for you guys, electronic sales or sales in general, and I moved into more of a business management role, um, focusing a lot on building a team, growing the company, and and, and I really like your guys' motto of always improving and 
Um, that's kind of one thing I'm trying to focus on as well is just really moving our business forward um, and, and making it a better company and serving our community better. So it's, it's very interesting. Uh, as you mentioned, our companies are very, very similar. We're very similar in size. Uh, yep. the, the number of uh, team members, uh, coverage area, the, the services that we offer, it's a very, very similar uh, concept. And it's very interesting. I think you bring a lot to the table, and that's why I, I'm really excited about today's conversation because it's, you, you kind of had that, uh, that second-generation locksmith vibe but yet you went out and kind of got some other experience and then came back so it's a, it's a completely different dynamic than just being that second generation locksmith um, uh, operations management and owner so uh, really really neat one of the really neat things about Tony is that he is a, he, he mentioned it always improving but he is a constant learner uh, whenever you're around Tony, he's going to ask you questions. He's going to gather information. He's going to find out uh, what's going on and how he can uh, either use it or not use it. Uh, yeah. It's it's just he's constantly asking questions. He's a very interesting uh, person to be around. You're never too old to learn. <laughs> never too old to learn. <laughs> Definitely got a lot of learning left to do. But so Tony and I, I was asking him this before we went uh, went live. I was like, Tony, where did we? Where where did we meet, or when did we first meet? Because I remember um, it's, it's all it's all wrapped around the Medico Security Center conference. Yep. Um, but I wasn't sure what that timeline was and when it happened. Um, and so Tony and I, um, as as well as Chris um, here, serve on the Medico Security Center advisory board. Um, and that's really kind of how we were introduced to each other earlier on um, and had some conversations, but it really, uh, we've started kind of building a relationship and kind of learning more about each other um, since the advisory board and, and have had a lot of fun together. We uh, hung out together at uh, ISC West in Vegas, had an uh, uh, In-N-Out burger. And that was delicious. Still talking about the burger. <laughs> and it's, it's, just, it's just been fun. By the way, uh, in my extensive research on uh, Minnesota and uh, Minneapolis, uh, it actually wasn't any research at all. I was watching a video <laughs> from, I think it's Bon Appetit, and they did. Did you know that um, Minneapolis, Minnesota is considered the home of the Juicy Lucy? Really? Did you know that, yep. Tony? Yes, I did. So – can you elaborate a little bit more? I've heard of it, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. Describe a Juicy Lucy for us. So you've never heard of, you've never, you don't know what a Juicy Lucy is. I know what one I'm is, on, and I'm excited I'm on, about on, it. I'm on the fringe. I've, I've had a couple okay. of explanations, and I've heard of it, but I don't know of it, if that makes any well, sense. Well, there's actually some contention in the area about who developed the Juicy Lucy. There's some argument that's Matt's Bar in South Minneapolis. I mean, there's some argument that's the 5A Club, and then some other restaurants try to claim it's there, So it's too. a lot like Brunswick Stew. There's about six people who have claimed yeah. to originate. But uh, basically, it's two small burger patties that are put with a piece of cheese in the middle, and then they're kind of molded together. So it's essentially one burger with cheese in the middle. And sometimes they'll put bacon in the middle. They'll put all sorts of stuff in the middle. But basically, it's a, a stuffed burger. Um, Matt's Bar in South Minneapolis, actually, it's right by our Minneapolis Lock and Key shop. Uh, when Barack Obama was in town like three, four years ago, he made a point to go there and check it out. It's a really small hole in the wall. There's probably five or six booths and a bar that you can sit at. It's cash only. Um, it's a great dive bar, and it's, it's a place that if anyone comes here, they should definitely check out. Um, I've only been there once, but it was delicious, and I need to go there again soon. But it, Juicy Lucy's are phenomenal. So I first heard about this several years ago. My wife kind of came upon it, and we made some at the house. But we we found this video on YouTube because that's pretty much like the only content. we Now that football season is here and then when the NBA season starts, that's the only time we really watch live television. Everything else is YouTube. Yeah. And, um, and so we came across this video. There's this guy – that goes around all of the places that claim to have the best Juicy Lucy's, and he taste tests them all in one day. It's like yep. he eats like, like seven or eight burgers. Food. Oh, my goodness. I was like, I can't imagine the amount. And, and it wasn't Oof. like he was just tasting it. He was eating the entire burger. <laughs> it was wild. But I said, you know, that's really a great thing. That's one more reason to go visit Tony. Um, so That's that we, right. can, we can kind of do the gauntlet and uh, and go taste out. I'm taste always the I'm always down for a really good cheeseburger. It's I'm always. We I'm actually have down. a lot of uh, a couple of my friends are really big burger aficionados, and I've gotten into it too. So there, there's a lot of good burger areas, not just Juicy Lucy's, but um, there's a lot of good burger places in South Minneapolis. There's a couple right by our Minneapolis store, besides Matt's and uh, 
you come here, we could go on a, a burger tour for about two weeks if you really wanted. A burger cruise. <laughs> I just want to cram it all in one day. Just eat all the burgers in one day. No, but, um, they, yeah, they had mats on there, and it looked amazing. But, anyway, that's really not what we want to talk about today. Now, coffee, because today is our, it's, it's coffee break. And kind of – I like to recap this because – it's really. I want to make make everyone aware. The concept behind this podcast is literally for months on end. Uh, Levi and Lucas would come in to my office around two o'clock in the afternoon. They still do. They still do. They still do. And they would make a fresh cup of coffee and they would sit around and we would have a 15, 20 minute conversation about. It could range anywhere from uh, building operations, building processes, uh, how to make the best uh, steak. You know, where to get the best cheeseburger. Um, it could be, you know, a variety of life's complexity of, sort of conversations. And I, I had this con- this concept one day of this is really interesting information, more so the kind of building processes for your business, yeah, less yeah. of the, 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 the food conversations. But that we should re- <laughs> record this and share this because it's, it's just normal conversation that we're having around um, kind of the table every single day. So that's really the concept of, of this, and so we always have coffee. So I've got my, my coffee here today. I know, Tony, you mentioned here recently, which I thought about it this morning, we did not go get a cup of coffee together. No, in, we didn't. In California when we were out there recently. But um, do you have your coffee with you this morning? I do. It's in a nice uh, medical security center mug. Look at you. Product yeah, placement. thanks to uh, the medical security <laughs> center team, Ben Salty and Leslie. Oh, goodness. I think Don't Ben's give watching. Ben a shout out. Ben's watching. Yeah. He's going to. Oh, my goodness. So uh, <laughs> you, you said you just recently kind of got into coffee or started to enjoy it a little more. A little bit, yeah. I, I don't do anything fancy like you, though. I still use the dreaded drip machine that probably makes you cringe. But uh, that's all I use for now until next time I come down there and you teach me some Norways to make coffee. We I, can fix that. We're, we're going to get you hooked up with uh, with a siphon brew. It's, yeah, it's, that looked pretty interesting. It looked like a lot of work, though, too. It, it's, it's worth it. It's, yeah, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's okay. getting, getting better. All right. So, uh, really, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Let's get into the kind of the meat of the conversation, which is um, – We've talked about kind of team building over the years um, and scaling business and, and so forth. We've got a lot of that information out there. So, But I wanted to dive into it a little more because this is something that that I think Tony and I both have a lot of conversations ar- around is when to hire, who to hire, and how to hire to build a team for scaling your business. Because it's not just about the number of people that you have in your organization. It's filling certain operational roles Um, and this has been really I don't know it just seems to be coming up more and more over the last couple of months we've been talking about it Um, Tony and I've talked about it I've talked about it with a lot of other other folks and the the first question well I don't know it's the first question a common question that runs the theme is when do you know how to hire for building your operation because in in a service business like we have you hire technicians that's that's a natural thing. You're constantly hiring yep. technicians. But then it comes to, okay, I need to build out an organizational structure for my business. Where do I start? Um, and that's the conversation that we've been having. So I wanted to kind of toss that off, Tony, to you first and kind of give us an understanding. What are your thoughts on it? Um, Kevin, I think, will bring an interesting uh, perspective to this as well because he was part of building an operational team here. Yep. Um, so he's going to bring that perspective. So from your perspective, how do you know, how do you identify, and, and where is the, the baseline, the tangible, that if someone was listening to this podcast, they could say, okay, that's something that I can start working towards? Um, one of my big philosophies kind of is, is I don't want to – I don't want to grow too fast and not have the infrastructure to support it. One of our biggest things is customer service. I want to make sure we're serving our customers. And and if we go out and get a bunch of sales and don't have the service team um, in the office to support that, it makes us not look good. So one of the big things I've done is, well, a couple of things was when I first started here, I realized I was trying to do way too much myself and then you can't get everything done yourself. Uh, someone told me something, I think it was a couple of years ago, that if someone can do something 70 to 80, 90% of your ability hire them, let them do it. And and that's one thing I really struggled with when I started was trying to um, do everything I can and, and not delegate to other people. And, and one thing I've learned over the last year or two, especially was to just hire really good people and let them do what they're good at. Um, and I think that, that that's one of the most important lessons I've learned is to just really let people do what they're good at. Yeah. 
Kevin, kind of talk on that a little bit because that, this is this is something that that I think every small business struggles with uh, from from an ownership or management pos position of the delegation, but really just not even delegating, but letting go of yeah, certain yeah. responsibilities. Right. Absolutely. So I would I would couldn't agree with you more. Um, I know, like when you talk about delegation and trusting people and relying on them to do what they do best. I know, Chad, that was one thing that when I first got started, you were like, hey, listen, you know, these are your responsibilities and you have these people to support you. And this is how you kind of, you know, you need to do it. And I was caught in that cycle, you know, that I wanted to handle everything from start to finish. And I had a huge problem with letting go because I had trust issues and I wanted to make sure that when I did something, I handled it from start to finish all the way to completion. I wanted a little piece of everything to make sure that it went right. And I mean, in some situations that can be a positive, but most of the time it, it's a huge negative because you're getting spread so thin and you're trying yep. to overextend yourself so much that you just get burned out. And I, I, I specifically remember when I first got started, you're like, don't get burned out. Don't get burned out. Don't get burned out. You know, you need to be in it for the long haul. Do not get burned out. You have to trust the people that are there to support you. You got to work on the handoff. And that's, really the gist of kind of what we've done here is we've we've set people up so that you know when my portion of whatever it is i'm doing is done i can feel confident in handing it off to someone else and trust and know that it's going to get done yeah it, it's it's all in kind of it, a lot of that conversation is based off of my failures over the years over my frustrations and and my lack of of handing off and and trusting other people to carry it through and so it's it's been a lot of lessons learned and it's it's been interesting uh, again this is a common theme that you deal with with building a business yeah i think a lot of people struggle with that it's it's a very i've never heard someone say that i have no problem that they have no problem delegating from the start of their business i think it's something you definitely have to kind of experience firsthand before you realize okay i just need to let go of this and and know it's gonna all work out. So Tony, for you, the question that I have is when you first started hiring for those types of positions, how did you know which position to hire first and, and kind of how did, what was the direction in that? I kind of tried to look at what was the biggest area that AI was spending my time on and what, you know, what was the biggest chunk of an area that we can spend time on? So um, one thing that we carved out, I was spending a bunch of time working on, on the sales side of the business, but I wasn't able to get back to my customers quick enough. Um, so I, we decided that I need to hire a full-time account manager, someone that can come in and completely relieve those duties from me. Um, and, and it was just such a big time suck for me that I knew it was something that would be really easy to, not easy, but something that would be a good set of, um, responsibilities to kind of pass on to someone. So, uh, we actually found a, a guy that was down in my area, worked in Alabama, or Alabama. Um, and he was moving up to the area and he's been working on great. And one thing I did struggle with right away when we hired him was still, uh, kind of letting go and, and letting him do his own thing. And it was actually after the MSC conference this year where I got back and I just realized, Hey, you need to just go do your own thing. I trust that you're going to do it right. You've been helping us out a ton and I need to really let you go because I'm holding you back from, from doing what you need to do. So one, one of the things on that side is, um, it, it it's very, very interesting. Uh, going back to one of the things we were talking about earlier when you get into this mode that you have to do everything you know it one it doesn't help build a team atmosphere because you're, right. you're kind of putting thing like i'm the only one that can fix all this and yeah, yeah. uh and so then it's like not not trusting and allowing your team to do things but the fact of the matter is ultimately you are not doing any of it really great because you're spread so exactly. thin and like you just said I, that was a hard thing for me that was a hard realization because I loved dealing with customers I loved finding solutions for customers and I would walk off of that meeting and then fail to follow up with them in a timely manner right and so yep. it was all it was all useless I'd wasted yeah. my time doing what I was I felt like I was doing great because I didn't I, I would walk out of that into these other things that I was in, in the middle of that I didn't need to be, but I just had my hands in it. Jack of all trade, master of none. Exactly. And, so and, I, and it just became I'm, so frustrating from my perspective. I was like, we have yep. to do something different. I don't know what it is, but we have to do something different. I was going to say another good analogy um, is I heard on one of my podcasts a couple of years ago was, do you want to be Applebee's or do you want to be the Capitol Grill? Do you want to do everything okay or yeah. do you want to do one thing really well? And, and that's kind of one thing I've tried to do within our business, too, is make sure that we're doing 
as little amount of things as possible and doing them really well. We don't do everything. Uh, we turn plenty of business away if it's something that we're, we're not, you know, not our expertise. And we really want to make sure that we're delivering a, a valuable product. I think that goes back to, to leadership as well, as you can't be doing everything. You need to focus on a couple of things that you're good at and, and let other people do, do things that they're good at. And it's, and that's really, I, I think going back to that question of where do you start? It's finding what, you know, kind of taking the time to assess your business and go, um, okay, what is it that, that is important for me to touch? What is it that I bring of, of major value to this organization that is going to be hard to replace? S focus on that and find other people that can uh, offset your weaknesses and do it better. Um, so okay. our, our original first step was we hired uh, Sam Gray to be the quote-unquote operations assistant because it was like I just needed somebody to – execute on some of the craziness that was happening an assistant to the regional district manager. <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so we we kind of put that in motion and and it was it was a really luckily for us sam was patient and worked through the process with us uh, but it was a very bad stab at kind of the first go of of delegation because it was a lot of micromanagement it was a lot of do this and then bring it back and all this back and forth yeah. And then when we finally said, okay, these are your responsibilities. So going back to where we've kind of arrived at now and kind of what you were talking about, Tony, is it's really important from, a, from an ownership or management perspective, in my opinion, to when you look at delegating, when you look at bringing on people for these specific things, that you go ahead and set out a process, set out clear expectations. Um, Dave Ramsey's Entree Leadership, they refer to them as, uh, as, as KRAs, um, so that you can hand that over to somebody. So like you said, Tony, when you got back from the MSC conference, you just said, hey, I trust you, go do your thing. It's also setting a, a guideline out to say, these are the expectations, work within these parameters, go at it you know yep. do it do it better than i was doing it and that's that's been my favorite conversation with team members as we bring them on is just like kevin uh zach nathan um uh, levi a lot of other guys in those areas uh lucas now mm -hmm. i bring them in and i say hey this is something that i've been doing not well <laughs> so I, i'm not going to train you on how <laughs> i was doing it not well but here's the parameter and this is what i want it to look like and I want you to make it better than what we can ever imagine it to be and and go and, and, and tackle it. And we've seen some great success with it because it's like, hey, here's a, here's a, a rough guideline and go make it better is, is kind of the concept. But it goes back to what you said, hire great people, hire people that you trust, hire people that, that can do that and then get out of their way. Right. Yeah, and, and around that same time, we hired an account manager. We also hired a. We had one of our our service coordinators retiring. He had been with us for about twenty years, so we had a big hole to fill there. And we hired a. Um, we kind of hired somebody that had a lot of other experience besides just service coordinating, and um, she helped me as well as in, in the extent that I wouldn't even imagine. You know, we hired her to do service coordinating, and all of a sudden, she took on a bunch of other roles as well. And and the relief of hiring two people that could help me out do. What I was trying to get done just opened me up for doing so many more additional things. And, and it wasn't something I would have even ever expected. And then looking back, I think about it and even talking to my dad about it, I don't know how I did all that stuff and I, and I wasn't doing it well. Yeah, it <laughs> um, and, and just seeing how sales have increased and just in general, how our business has grown since then is, has been tremendous. And it's allowed me to free up time to do other things to help with that growth. Kevin, from your perspective, and because again, I want to I want to gauge some of the other side. You have been in roles before where you were you know, judge, jury, and executioner yes. type yes. type thing. And and then you've come into this process where we had, it's not perfect by no, any stretch, no. but we have we had matured the process a little bit, yeah. evolved it maybe a little bit to, to where, uh, you know, like you said, we had those conversations of, you know, it's not just putting your work off on somebody else when you're done with it, but it's mm -hmm. making sure that your work is done so that the next person can right, carry so it off with person, confidence. Right, right. Tell us a little bit about, talk a little bit about that perspective and, and what it is for you, the difference between those two oh, yeah. operations. Well, you know, again, past experiences, like you said, it was, it was start to finish. It was hands-on. Um, and again, there are certain situations where that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
It's just when you start to get overtaxed and you get, you know, it's like, okay, I've done this. Well, I can do a little bit more. No, I'm fine. Just keep keep giving it to me. Let's keep going. Because you kind of get, or I got into this mode where it was like, I can just do it on my own. I don't need anybody. I'm fine. I can handle the work. You know, just, yeah. I got that head, you know. Yeah. I just, just get out of my way. I, I don't want to explain it to you. Just forget it. I'll mm-hmm. handle it myself which is not healthy. Uh, There's a lot of stress at home and at work. So, you know, the difference between what was and what is is just like night and day. Yeah. Because I don't have, I mean, I still have a few issues here and there I'm working through, you know, trying to, again, trust the people behind me, Um, you know, and it's a constant struggle, uh, but it's a whole lot better because there are a lot of situations where, I finish my piece and I know that it's complete and I know that the person that's coming in behind me has the correct information. They have concise information. They have detailed instructions. They know exactly what to do. And if there's a question here or there, you know, I've lightened up a whole lot where I can answer it and not just say, all right, you know, forget it. I'm coming. Yeah. Just don't touch anything kind of deal. Um, so it's, it's very, very nice. And, you know, to put it in a little bit of a, it's football season, so we have to, you know, throw the football analogy <laughs> okay, out there. Here we go. Um, but so one thing that's kind of stuck with me, and it, it doesn't necessarily apply to football, but I feel that it pl- applies to life. <laughs> as so many, as so many, just going to bring football in there for yes. no reason, really. Well, but so when I in high school, when I was playing football, uh, I was a I was a defensive lineman, and my coach one day. You know, he came to us and said, because, you know, obviously I was a lineman. They don't get much glory, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. You're just there to do your job. One thing that he said that has really stuck with me over the years is you have to let the athletes be athletes. Everyone has a role. Know your role. Do it well and do it right. Yeah. And, I, again, I think that covers so many bases in life and in business. You have to let the athletes be athletes. You yeah. have to know your role. Do it. Do it to the best of your ability. Do it 100%. And as a team, you yeah. can win the game. It's it's interesting because we throw around the word uh, team, especially in small business, I think very lightly a lot of times. Um, but if you really dive into the team atmosphere, you know, any sports team. Oh, yeah, any sports team. Football, basketball, uh, baseball, I don't know, understand it. Um, soccer, I don't understand <laughs> and, and hockey doesn't make any sense. But anyway, the two sports <laughs> that I know – uh, football and basketball is if you had all guards playing basketball, then you would be at a disadvantage. If you Correct. had all centers, you would be at a disadvantage. You have to have that diversity on your team for the specific positions that need to be filled, so that the team operates as a as a fluid, you know, organization, not just one person. Well, take a look back at um, one of the operations meeting a few a few weeks ago when I was talking about the Oakland Athletics yeah. and and the whole Moneyball thing. What what the book and the movie is based out of. You know, they were in a tough spot, and they had you know one guy that was particularly good at doing one thing, mm-hmm. and they had to match him up with someone who was you know good in something completely opposite in order to make the team work. And everybody thought they were nuts and they were crazy and this was never going to work. They had no stars, you know, they had no power whatsoever. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the numbers lined up, and it was, I mean, they have, I think, the still the the standing longest winning streak in MLB history. Yeah. Now, they didn't win the pennant, nope. but. Yeah, but it, it, it goes back to prove that if you have the right people in the right seat on the, the bus. The right process. Then, then you. Then I was you, just going to say that same exact thing. Yeah, then it, you, find, well, you find a lot of success. One thing I would say that's somewhat contradictory to that that we've actually found out to be helpful, though, is the most important thing, as you guys are kind of talking about, is that the most important thing to a good company is having the right people. Um, and one thing that we've had is a couple people that have come in, we don't really have open positions, um, but we can tell they'd be a tremendous fit to our team, just that the culture, the, the, the attitude they bring. And we've actually hired a couple people that we didn't have a, a seat for at the time, um, but we knew we'd be able to find a seat. So that'd be one recommendation I'd have for people is, mm. If you do find a couple people that come in out of the blue that are looking for jobs and you can just tell they're going to be a great fit somewhere, it, it, sometimes it's worth a, a risk to hire them even if you don't have an open position because we've had a couple employees that have worked out tremendously when, when we didn't really even have an open position and, and now I can't imagine not having them. So. so one last thing I want to kind of talk about as we bring this thing to a close, and it was, it was spurred off of something Kevin was just talking about. Uh, when, you, when you still have those moments, when you still have those struggles of, you know, Hey, this is not working, and then you 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 have to make that decision. Just stop, and I'll come there and and help. Or 
or figure out a way to, to solve the problem. Tony, I want to toss it to you first. I've got an example because it's very, very recent, like within the last 24 hours. But how do you identify um, issues that you have learned are solely built around you, a process that's solely built around you as the nucleus and and you, you found it as a weak point in your organization. Do you do you have that, or you you got all those figured out? Where um, try to describe it in maybe a different way. So, yeah, I mean, you lost me a little there. So so there's there's a process within your organization that ultimately requires your input for it. Like everything comes to a standstill until you give the the proper direction. Do you have any of those in your business? I think they come up occasionally every day, small and big. Um, I think when it becomes a, I don't know if this is answering your question, but to me, when it becomes a point where you realize it's taking up too much of your time, you need to figure out a better way to do it. And I, I think your guys' motto is that we believe there's a better way. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of ties into when, when you realize that you're, I don't know if this is answering your question, but when you realize that there's a big, you're the big cog in the wheel, you yeah. need to find a way to work around that. I don't know if that answers. No, that is exactly the answer to the question. Do you have, and, and, and I'll give my example to see if you have any to kind of apply to it. But here recently, um, so we were, we were just talking about it at the beginning of the podcast, we had uh, this, this hurricane that came about and then there was a tropical storm. Well, when the hurricanes, we started getting warnings, everybody was coming to my office. Hey, there's a hurricane coming. There's a hurricane. Coming. What are we going to do? I'm like, I don't know. I, you know. I've never dealt with a hurricane before. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I don't know. It progressed, it progressed, and then we had you know some flooding in the area over the weekend, and then the question was, what are we going to do on Monday morning? Like, are we going to run service? Is there capability to run service? And everything was pointing back to kind of what is Chad's decision going to be on, on operations? Well, ultimately what it came down to is I was going yesterday morning when all this was kind of happening, I was getting ready to board an airplane, and I was going to be <laughs> airborne for an hour and a half and not accessible. I did, was not going to have internet. I was not going to have cell phone service. I was not going to be able to phone call, and all of these decisions had to be made. And I had this moment of realization of I, I was frustrated with myself because I allowed me to be the cog in the wheel, right, that said, Everything is waiting on me. So what happens if I'm deathly sick or whatever? I'm inaccessible. Right. Like, like what happens to this whole process? So my answer to it was, and this is kind of where I was, I was trying to, to see what your process was, but my answer to it was the entire flight. I was typing um, on, my, <laughs> on my phone a process. I had to document the process because I did not want it to be solely reliant upon the information that was in my head or the process that I defined in my head. It had to be documented so that it could be shared with the, the, the appropriate people so that that decision, you know, it's one of the things that I'm really trying to get better at um, in, in this organization is documenting processes so that I would. whoever comes across it knows exactly what needs to be done, picking up an instruction manual and carrying it on. I would agree with that. That's one thing we struggle with a lot is we have very little documentation. We've started creating some more because I've realized the need for it, but it, it's one thing that we really struggle with. And even at my old job, it's one thing I struggled with. My manager would always tell me, you need to document this. And I was just like, this is the most boring thing ever. Why would I want to document this? And Blowchance. didn't quite understand the, the high level of it. Now being on the other side, I understand it's extremely important that you need, if you're not there or if someone's not there, it needs to be a process in place so that someone else can step in and do the job temporarily or permanently, wherever it may be. Yeah, it's, it, I think that, my again, my recognition of it is if it requires my input, then I have done a poor job of documenting my, my perspective, my opinion, or whatever, or the opinion of the organization. And, and so if we can document it and have it accessible then anybody can make that call because they it's it's kind of like going back to and I'm I, I'm just stuck on this right now core values in defining those core values so that anybody can kind of run any question through that filter should yep. we do this well let's apply it through these core values yep. yes or no and then you move on because it's a flow chart right yes it is a flow chart <laughs> and it sounds awfully like every time I come to ask you a question about something it the answer I get is, well, let me give you my opinion, not necessarily an answer. Yes, because I, I want – and the whole reason I, – I adapted that philosophy from a couple of books that I read, but the re reason I give those answers is because I want to teach how to make the decisions, not um, give the answer, because then I'm, it's just going to be a constant yeah. revolving door of questions. Right, Tony? 
That's right. Any closing thoughts? I've kept you longer than I than I asked you for. That's okay. Um, not really. I guess one question I think that I have that may be uh, beneficial for listeners is what are kind of some of the main books that you've read? I know the answer to this, but um, what are some of the main books that you've read that have kind of helped you with, with growth? And I can maybe give some of my thoughts as well. Have you ever heard of Turning the Ship Around? <laughs> Fantastic. I've never heard Chad talk turn. about that. Never heard me talk about it. So here's the situation. I, do you want the list of books that I've read completely or the books that I've started and not finished? Which, ones, which list is doesn't matter. Out? Whichever ones have been the most impactful. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I, the, the way that I digest a book, the, the books that I've read completely is Entree Leadership, um, Turn the Ship Around, and the Steve Jobs biography. Those are books okay. that, and there's probably been a few more, but those are the ones in, in most recent years that have impacted me the most. The Steve Jobs biography was a crazy interesting story, but it also taught me about how to not be the over, like, crazy leader that just drives everybody insane. Like, that, that was Steve Jobs. He got, the, he got the most out of people, but he got the most out of them, and then they were, they were done. You know, they're burnt, they burnt out. They were, you, you've got so, you've got these people that are still in the organization and you have all these people that are like, yeah, I worked for Steve Jobs for five years and I'm not anymore because I can't take it. What was your I'm curious? What was your takeaway on that? As far as you know, he was obviously extremely successful. He built the largest company in the world. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, what could he have done differently to still get all that? This is probably a whole nother podcast, yeah, but yeah, let, we, we may reschedule that one. It 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 was it's it's a lot. You know, there there was the, the whole story there. It, he 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 gets ousted from the company, learns a lot, you know, from failure, and then comes back and is a completely different person. He still has a okay. lot of similarities, but he comes back as a different Makes person. Sense. Um, yeah. The the other book, uh, Turn the Ship Around, is about how to build organizational structure to empower. Uh, everybody in your team to be a leader and to make decisions that was very impactful for me because that changed that philosophy of waiting for everybody to come up and ask me questions to being able to answer that question like kevin just said is let me give you my philosophy on it so that you know the parameters um some other books that have helped me out like it kind of my in my personal world and especially in business partnership because you know chris chris and i are two completely different personalities um uh, the idea monkey um, is hmm. is one um, that I uh, that I really grasped a hold of because it it really kind of dissected about stories of partnerships um, where there's there's someone that kind of has ideas and then there's somebody that has like reasoning <laughs> and and then how they work together. Uh, oh yeah, that's you guys. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> it talked about stories like uh, Roy and Walt Disney and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and. Some of the great partnerships of, uh, of of large businesses over time, and how there was one person that was like just you got to have a pitch man, and you got to have a backer. There you go. So so the, that type of stuff, those have been very very beneficial. Um, uh, Eat the Frog is a prioritization um, uh, book that I've read, and there's a there's a lot of them. But anyway, I've, I've probably talked too long. What are your books? Uh, two of my favorite ones are Start With Why by Simone Sinek, uh, just kind of all about having, you know, not only what is your purpose, but what is your company's purpose. And it's a, and as opposed to starting or as opposed to going uh, what, how, why, you always need to start with why you're doing something and then everything else will kind of follow suit. Um, it's a great book. I haven't, it's been three, four years since I've read it, but it, I should probably revisit it. But it, it's a great book for anyone that's not even running a business, just what they're doing in their life. Um, another one that I really like is by Daniel Pink. It's called Drive. Um, his main thing is all about motivating people and how historically everyone thought carrots and sticks were the best way to motivate people. Um, where now it's more about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. People like to do things on their own. That kind of goes back to the leadership thing. Instead of telling someone exactly what they need to do, um, tell them what you want to accomplish and let them figure out how to do it. Um, people like to master things. They like to be an expert at things. And again, that goes back to what we were talking about with leadership. Let yeah. people have that, that mastery. Um, and then lastly, purpose. People want to know a, a greater purpose of what they're doing instead of just, hey, go do this and I'll pay you this, you know, figure out, you know, have a, a larger goal. And that actually ties directly back to that, the, the why that Simone Sinek talks about and, and know why you're doing something. So to me, those are very impactful books. Um, I'm not a huge reader. I love learning, but reading's always been a, something I can never concentrate on. But those were books that I breezed right through because they were so interesting. 
Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying I, I'll start a book uh, traveling or uh, listening to an audio book or something, and it'll spur an idea, and then I'm like, ah, go off and do this other crazy thing, and then I, I never get back to Guilty. it. Guilty. Kevin, what do you have, book recommendations? Um, it's not really business <laughs> development related, <laughs> um, but the last book that I read, like on a personal level, was called The Habit of Rivers. Yeah, it's about a guy who does a lot of fly fishing, but it's not about fly fishing. It's a lot about you know, finding your inner self, and it's a lot about of enlightenment, enlightenment, and realizing the world around you. So, it's I felt it was very strong for, like, personal development because sometimes you just got to slow down and really appreciate what's in front of you. Yeah, interesting. Well, cool, Tony. Again, thank you very much for. Uh, for yeah, thank you guys. Today. It was this was an amazing conversation. Um, really hope that uh, our our podcast listeners get some value out of it, and um, if you like this content share it um, if you have any questions any uh, topical discussion ideas that you would uh, you want to hear us kind of chat about or some processes that you would like us to kind of dive in more of please feel free to comment um, share these videos share the podcast and uh, obviously visit us on our website lockdoc.net tony's website is uh, www.blmss.com and then we actually just launched a new uh, Minneapolis Lock and Key website that's minneapolislockandkey.com so they're both got a similar theme to them uh, kind of kind of eventually co-brand the two um, but check them both out and give us feedback you forgot the http <laughs> <laughs> colon forward slash forward, forward slash. slash thank you tony thank you kevin thanks guys have a great day and we'll see you next time on our coffee break <laughs>